Okay, Brian, we got a chance to play uh, Eldorath tonight. <clears throat> um, oh, and you can see I'm slowly getting stuffed back in my room. Um, oh, and it's November, no shave November, prostate cancer awareness month. More men die from prostate cancer than women do from breast cancer. Um, so we start off the session talking about uh, virtual tabletops, actually. Um, because our, our GM and I, for that matter, have been thinking about different ways to uh, get enough features with the virtual tabletop without getting more than we need kind of thing. And uh, he came across Owl Bear Rodeo, which uh, we pulled up. We all jumped on, just kind of messing around, took a few things out. Because we were waiting for a couple of the other players to show up. And the only thing we didn't notice was dynamic lighting that we were kind of looking for. No, not really necessary, but it would be nice. Um, but this is our initial this initial appraisal. It worked fine for us because we used it. But we didn't do any real combat. We didn't do any combat. That's really kind of at all in this session. Um, but for maps and moving stuff around and everything else, it seemed to work fine. So we're looking into that. But um, we had to do some rewind because one of the players wasn't here for the end of the last session and got to ask the dragon a question. Um, and Runt asked, what is the greatest threat to us other than you? And the dragon thought about that for quite a while. Or rather, GM did. And he comes out and he says, the iron wind. And so this is one of those tie backs into the previous science fiction game and how when I first started the science fiction game, the previous fantasy game had transitioned to science fiction. And that was with the science fiction game, and then we transitioned to fantasy again. This is back and forth kind of thing that the GM is doing. Because the iron wind we ran into in, in the uh, science fiction game. And so I, oh, wait, wait. Something's going to happen now. And so uh, the GM had us all roll percentile. And uh, Runt and Alexander and Alvis all rolled pretty low, which means they grab their heads, huge pain. They have these visions of some other reality, right? Uh, and it was actually a particular incidence where terrorists at the party was running through a trauma unit shooting up a physician and an alien and the black goo stuff and uh runt who was not actually a player when we were in the fan science fiction game uh so jim just kind of threw him in there he, he was at this place and was watching things happening right um and so that happens to him. Alexander was actually not back yet. For, he had to work tonight, so he, he came in late. So we'll have to tie him in because his character in the science fiction game didn't start until after this particular incident occurred. But uh, Alvis was with the party when we were doing the sh shootout through the, uh, the trauma center. Uh, so he saw the same thing just from his point of view, right? Um Every one of all the rest of us, we feel this ominous feeling that this is bad, but we don't know why, which is also very bad. Um, and then we get back into the game stuff. So um, uh, Raymond checks everything to see if it's cursed. Nothing is cursed. Uh, we've got the um, silvered, what we assume is steel, male hauberk, um, the shield that came with it, and the sword that came with it specifically and then we get back to where we actually ended the last session with alexander and found the remnants of a road going off into the hills so we go crump it through there um we talk a little bit about the map because the map shows the swamp area from before the swamp was there and where the where uh, the moat house is uh, on the map is a community of some sort there and then there are roads that we know of plus roads that we don't know of including the road we're on. Um, and as we're traveling, Raymond is perusing the Herbalism and Plant Lore book because he knows Norse. And they're written in Norse. 
and then the rest of us speak English. Okay, um, but we do notice as we're going along, there's a campfire pit along our path. So we send Ron, to, we should send Alexander too, but because they got really close sneak and hide skills together. They're really close together. One's 68 and 67, right? But we sent Runt out there and um, he sneaks up there and he sees a man sitting at a, at a, a campfire. He's got a spit roasting something. There's a gypsy wagon there. The guy's not dressed like a gypsy. There are chess, chairs set up around the fire pit area. And so instead of Runt just coming back and saying, hey, this is what I saw, he goes on and does his thing again, right? Sneaking around, whatever. But gets, he fumbles his, his sneak roll, ends up tripping over a rock, and the rock has a rune on it. Turns out to be a warding rune. It's one of the things this guy sells. Uh, but the guy's really affable and you know invites him to the camp and he eventually goes around the fact that he's got friends out there we'll bring them in and so he whistles for us and there's some discussion on, okay is a whistle a good whistle or a bad whistle do we <laughs> come and rescue him or do we just walk on in but say la be so we come in and there's some discussions about you know what we've been doing what we found in the swamp about the girl the witch and the dragon uh, he kind of mentions about how he would not want to be in our shoes with this witch who's pissed at us for what she, we did to her by letting the dragon loose. You know, we had not really thought about that, had we? No. Uh, what else we've been involved in? Somebody brings up the howler and the spelt alarm. He says, oh, you're responsible for that whole ball of Intelligar. And he talks about it a little about 100 years ago. There's a kingdom of the East that attacked and these new aggressions, the ancient uh, lieutenants of Ford being involved and the sentinels came up and so he, we talk back and forth about that. He tells us, you know, the sentinels are be, not beholden to anyone. Uh, they're particularly concerned about undead. And they seek out and, draw, and destroy wherever they find it. Uh, he has had dealings with them from time to time. Uh, he travels around a bit. Uh, so we kind of ask, oh, who are you? <laughs> and his name is Luther. And he trades in rare uh, commodities, specifically artifacts. And so he starts asking if he come across anything unusual. You know, his interest is in artifacts. He's interested in anything coming out of the swamp, really. And Runt mentions the map because he wants to get rid of it. Don't know why he's got this fear of doing, you know, dangerous things. So why is he an adventurer? Because he's being tracked down with us. But I don't know. Let's, let's start to have some bad feelings about this guy. Um, uh, so Runt is trying to We've got this map. We're gonna take buy, buy this map and then you know give us money. And Raymond's not gonna let that thing go. Neither is Wes. Um, we do show him the map and we look at it and that kind of thing. But you know, Raymond says hey, we have no interest in selling this. He does. Uh, Luther, Luther does mention that there are curators in Telgar. It would be very interested in you know the underlay of this map of the, what was here at the swamp before the swamp was. And again, Ron keeps trying to sell this thing off. Uh, but eventually things get around that. And the, you know, well, well, we got this hauberk and we got the shield and we got the sword. Um, and there's a little bit of haggling on you know normally I charge a hundred silver an item, but I'll give you a discount. 50 a piece, so that's 150 silver. And uh, we've got some gems that have been appraised, 1,000 thousand silver worth of gems. So we get out 120 worth, um, or 100 to 120 worth, I think is what it was. It was the kind of discussion, but I'm thinking it's just 120 worth, right? And he goes, hey, throw in you know another 50 silver, and that'll be good. And there's some discussion back and forth. We haven't given him 300 copper, which is which is 37, which comes up to 150 gold anyway. Because we got like 500 copper pieces <laughs> from from our all from the witch, um, but we do verify that in fact all three of these are steel items. All three of them are in fact enchanted and uh, are of high quality. The uh, sword has uh, the cow symbol mark on it from when we got the gold plate and the uh, crystal goblets and stuff. Uh, so it's Plus one magical enchantment, plus one quality bonus. So it's plus 10% total to hit and plus two damage for the sword. Um, the armor absorbs half again. That's what the steel does. 
plus plus two. So it's, it's pretty decent stuff. It's, you know, very, very handy. Uh, at that point, he calls it a night and says, you know, you're invited to stay around the campsite and make this your own kind of thing. Next morning, he gets up early and leaves. Uh, we continue towards the river, uh, south of the river, where we are. We know is the ford. If we went to the east side of the river, it would take us longer than if we just crossed at the ford and then went up the road. So that's what we do. We arrive on Kron, which is day two of week one of Lotar, which is the eighth month, which is winter. About noon, we arrive in Hamlet. So we all do a little personal stuff. Wes takes care of his horse. He cleans himself, gets himself all cleaned up. Um, Tindo takes the girl, Chloe, to the church uh, to discuss with the priest on, you know, what we can do for this girl. Uh, they're going to try and do some uh, ceremonies. Ceremonies? Rituals. Rituals with her to see if they can't figure out what happened. Um, but Tindu ends up taking ends up taking her home to her mom, who speaks Norse, by the way, even though Tindo doesn't. Um, they get her cleaned up, and uh, Chloe and Tindo's mom start talking and get a real uh, rather repertoire going on between them. Um, and so later on. Tindo's mom talks to Tindo and says, you know, hey, there's nothing wrong with that girl. She says she's from a place called Karsh. Uh, they were fleeing from a war. The boat they were in was captured by goblin raiders, and they were enslaved and sold to the witch. Uh, later that day, the rest of us are kind of hanging out at the inn. Uh, Tindo did talk to Runt earlier that day, but Runt was drunk and doesn't remember anything. So back in the church, the rituals reveal that the witch used a crystal to siphon off Chloe's life energy. So once they find out about that, where's that crystal? Wes has it. So they come to the end. Wes goes up and gets it, brings it down. And like with all the cursed items, we go to the druid. <laughs> and so we go to the druid. Hey, we got this thing. Well, it's not evil. I'm not sure what's going on. And so we tell him what's been happening. And he says, yeah, this thing's full of power. How much power? More power than you've got, kind of thing, right? There's a lot of power in it. And uh, in game speak, power and mana or magic points are two different things. And so Brian is thinking, is this thing alive? It has actually POW power, a characteristic, right? And it doesn't. It's not really alive, but it's got a lot of something that's not just magic points in it, right? And he does mention something about being kind of like a cap spell. It was and is used as a focus, um, so it can tap energy out of somebody that somebody else then can draw from. Uh, the druid thinks that there is a ritual they can do that would undo the process, um, but it's possible that the crystal may be damaged in the process of doing that, and it may be as simple as getting the person who put their life energy into it to simply. Hold on to it and get all the energy back. So Tindo goes home, gets her mom and Chloe, and they come out. Um, when Chloe sees the druid's bear, she gets all excited, wants to go over and pet it, and, you know, scratch behind the ears and that kind of thing. Um, so while it's, <laughs> she's distracted, the druid starts casting some spells, find out some information he can on Chloe. And he's really thinking that maybe if we just hand it, you know, she can just hold it herself, that the energy will know that it's her and go back to where it belongs. Uh, you know, won't be that complicated of a deal. So Tindo tells her mom this, that to get Chloe to take the crystal, we put the crystal on the ground next to Chloe. As soon as she sees though, she starts to freak and back it up, back into the bear. And the bear starts gruffing at her, right? And she's like listening to it and she, you know, we, we think they're just talking, right? The, the bear's talking to her and she's understanding. Just pick it up. You'll be okay. You know, like that thing, right? So she, you know, she picks it up and sure enough, all this energy goes flowing right back into her. Um, She physically changes. She's no longer in her mid-20s. She's like 17 or 18 now, which is not 12. 
Um, and then she goes back to um, Tindo's house with Tindo's mom to, to you know continue dealing with things. Uh, we take a week of downtime, get our check marks. Oh, so the live plays in the description, and I didn't start the live play at the beginning. I started the live play pretty much where we actually started playing the game again. And uh, there'll be some stuff later on. We start rolling for dice and stuff like that, where I should have cut off earlier, but I didn't. You're going to go, hey, nobody's be, we're just talking, you know, training times and stuff like that. Nobody needs to hear that. So eventually cut it off. Uh, okay. So we figure out, okay, what are we going to do? Well, we were given a couple of options of things to do before. We kind of decide, well, let's, let's go to Minoc and check things out there. And this is the slaver city, right? And they speak Norse over there. And Wes is the only one. Wes, uh, Raymond is the only one here who actually speaks Norse. So we've got to train or research Norse for ourselves. Now in, in the village here, uh, Tino's mom will be more than happy to, you know, coach people along when they're Norse. They'll take about a month and they'll get 20% out of that. Um, but Wes is thinking, I cannot just sit around here for a month learning Norse. Um, I can go to Elgar, I can get a real teacher, and I can probably learn more faster there doing that. So then there's a the discussion between me and the GM, okay, what's the give and take? It's going to take so many days to get there, so many days to get back, that leaves a, a blocked out time of left, but um, I decide Wes is going to do this, because Wes, there are things that he needs to work on that he can only work until there's nothing nothing here in Hamlet he can train on or practice we can do his own little research thing you know practice and stuff but still you know fencing magic all this stuff Telgar right so I decided to do that and we've got a little page on our character sheet spreadsheet thing about training times and stuff like that um, it's actually set for a five-day work week, um, but Eldarath actually has five full days plus two half days in a work week, and then there's two days off because it's a nine-day week and calendar stuff, right? So we actually end up more time in Eldarath than is what's on the sheet itself, but you know, we just figure things out. So <clears throat> on the sheet, Wes can go from zero to twenty in Norse in 90 hours of training. With the time he has, he's got a total of 192 hours, at least 102 hours left to play with other stuff. Working on his fencing, his offhanded dagger attack, his dagger parry, his familiar law spell list, and uh, worship Celeste, because Wes has been thinking recently that he needs, needs a little more religion in his life, and he should be. I'm, you know, he's one of the nobles. He should be involved with that kind of stuff. So, I initially calculated this completely wrong. <laughs> Had way too much time going <laughs> going on. So I go back to okay, no, that's not right. It was 192 hours. Somehow I had ended up initially with uh, 960 hours <laughs> for the month. <laughs> Just think about 960 hours in five weeks. <laughs> yeah, that didn't add up. So I went back through and recalculated the stuff out. And so I had to cut out the fencing and the dagger parry, which, you know, essentially go together. <clears throat> and are pretty close anyway. You don't really mess too much with them. Um, but I really want to get that offhand dagger attack because now that I'm actually getting my parries in to do the repost, I need that dagger attack skill. It's like 30%, something like that. Once it's all said and done. So... Um, I take that 102 hours and I divide it up between offhanded dagger attack and familiar law and worship Celeste. And so I get, you know, 6% here, 4% there, and 10% and in worship Celeste because it goes from 0 to 10. And so while I didn't get as much as I was hoping I was going to be able to get out of going to Telgar, you know, I, I got enough, I think, to, to make a difference. So that's how that session all ended. It's now the first month of the year. Oh, I need to put the year on here.
Sorry about that. <laughs> First month of the year. It's called lore, by the way. It's the second week and the ninth day of the week. So we're about to go to week three. When Wes gets back, we'll start figuring what we're going to do. And everybody's got their 20% in Norse. And uh, that's pretty much about it for everybody else. So they've got to uh, make a living. <laughs> I think. Yeah, that was one of the, the issues. Yeah, it's good. The only thing, you know, you can do your research on this Norse stuff, but the rest of time you're going to be working and doing stuff. So we'll see how that all pans out as it goes. Um, not necessarily a whole lot got done, but a lot of preparation happened. Found out some stuff. I mean, we got, you know, magic sword, magic armor, magic shield, three different people. So, and then we got. Uh, Raymond's got the, the magic armor, so he gave his old armor to one of the guys. We got another tank ish <clears throat> thing going up. Um, and we'll see how things go from there. Happy gaming. <laughs>